Hey, folks, welcome back to the Living in the Virtue of Your Strengths podcast. My name is Matt Engel. I'm a certified Catholic mindset coach with Metanoia Catholic, and I'm also a certified Gallup Strengths coach. And on this podcast, we explore what it means to live our Gallup Strength Finders, our different talents that we have from our Strength Finder report. How do we live them virtuously? How do we deploy them in ways that are building up God's kingdom and calling us to be the best versions of ourselves, become fully alive, become saints, right? And not just saints in isolation, but in the body of Christ and really operating, complementing one another in all of our unique giftedness. One of the things that we do at Metanoia Catholic is we help people to explore their unique design and we see temperaments, but really strengths finder here is one of those incredible tools that we have. Uh, at our disposal here to really mine in and explore the unique design. When we explore into our unique design and we reflect on ourselves in the image and likeness of God, we reflect on that imago dei, we can't help but reflect on the divine designer. When you reflect on the design, you can't help but reflect on the, the divine designer. Okay, so we're going to be reflecting specifically today on the designer's design of drum roll, please. Here we go. Burr, burr, burr. Context, context. And for one of those themes that's that's rare to find in your top 10, we've got a couple of people that are at number one. We've got two here. So we welcome those people that are high context. I was sharing with the group at the beginning, beginning, uh, beginning of the call today. I had been harping on a buddy of mine to take the Strengths Finder assessment for a long time. I finally got his results, and he was number one context. I knew it. I knew he was number one context, too, because it's a buddy of mine from the Marine Corps. He was the one that always had uh, the, the military history behind it. Each one of his kids is named after a saint, but then there's also some Civil War general's name that's like the middle name so uh, built in. So very, very important. You can see the context oozing into his life over there. Uh, but on this podcast, you, there's a lot of different Strengths Finder podcasts that are out here. Again, we're exploring how each one of these talents today, specifically context, can show up virtuously, viciously, and then what are the mindsets behind it? So again, at Metanoia Catholic, we are mindset coaches. And we understand that what we think is the beginning of how we show up. All right. So the perceptions that we choose with our minds, with our free will, will incline us to act and behave in certain ways. Those habitual ways that we express ourselves, uh, they show up really in our in our talent themes here, okay? So wanna make sure we have good mindsets that incline us towards virtuous expressions of our talents in this day, uh, today context. We'll be exploring that, but also identify where we might be showing up viciously and what are the mindsets behind that. All right. As always, we start with our baseball card. So let's dive right in here. So pull this from uh, what they provide us at uh, from Gallup at our certification. So this is just to give a high level overview of what context is. I'll just read through this. If you're watching along on YouTube, you can see the slide in front of you. If you're just listening in, well, you'll, you'll get the gist of it. Okay. So context. This is how the person with context will show up. They'll say, I am, how are they being? I am appreciative of my predecessors and prior events. Appreciative of my predecessors and prior events. I will, what are they doing? I will remember important history. I bring, what's their contribution? I bring accurate memories and valuable memorabilia. I need, what's that requirement to easily show up in that place of contribution? I need relevant background for discussions and decisions. I love, what's the thing they value? I love the retrospective. It's people that can look back and be retrospective. I hate, again, revealing what they value. I hate when the past is forgotten. That metaphor image, a rear view mirror is essential for safe driving. And a barrier label might be stuck in the past. Okay, so that's our baseball card, high level view of context. At this point, I'd like to jump into... Uh, jump into here our uh, word picture. So if you're watching on YouTube, you can see the smattering of images that I have on the page, but I'll explain what we've got and go left to right. Uh, to just give a little bit of a word picture of, it, that helps us to understand what drives this talent theme. Where is it this talent theme seeking to rest? What drives context? 
Okay, so the first thing I have is this image of like a family tree, and I've got the little 23 and me that's there. And I it's really I haven't done it yet. Um, you know a lot of friends that have done it and they've actually found relatives or found uh, I've heard of even people even finding long lost siblings through this 23 and me. Uh, but it's it's a neat thing that kind of reveals just a, your history, uh, the migration patterns of your family. And so uh, some people enjoy knowing where they're from, where they're coming from. Somehow that reveals something about the present moments. Okay. Hold this from last week. I've got, we were soldiers, Hal Moore, again, Colonel Hal Moore from that movie. It was on the strategic, but I was like, you know, what? I got to bring him back because you would just see him reading these military history books, reading about before he showed up in Vietnam, he read all about the, uh, the history of the French in Vietnam and understanding the guerrilla tactics. And, and, and so when he showed up there, he had flipped the map around. He knew how the enemy fought and he was able to respond accordingly. Uh, and so I think of how more there, uh, I think of my buddy, uh, I was sharing, his name is Ben. And uh, when we were in Afghanistan together, he was at a different outpost. And I remember the night where he, there was a full on attack on his outpost. And I was just listening on the radio, a couple of, uh, about, about 20, 20 miles away from where he was at. And he was, he's just like every, at the way that he speaks, he just, he sounds like he's from some other period, right? Now he always had such an appreciation for, for civil war. And I remember the commanding officer yelling, like getting on the SATCOM and, and, and saying, Hey, I need a, I need a sit rep. I need a sit rep. And he, he comes over the radio and he goes, sir, the battle is well in hand. <laughs> and my CEO goes, that is not a sit rep. <laughs> Give me more context. Give me more context here. And so, but it was just, it was just funny the way that he, all of a sudden he showed up and he was just like, like general, general Custer. Um, anyways. Okay. So I've got the image also from the movie, the lion King. All right. And it's symbol looking up at the stars. Why is that significant? Because the stars, at least what was indicated in that movie his father told him those were the Kings of the past. And when he looked up at those stars, those images of the kings of the past revealed the, the, the royal lineage that he was a part of. So it revealed part of his identity by looking and reflecting on that past. Got an image of some really old books here. I think of the church fathers. I think of so many of the, um, of the theologians that were once Protestant that have come into the faith by reading into the church father, fathers, going into those original first century uh, monks, uh, early monastics, and what they wrote, and that context being something that really gives clarity to the church that Christ established. I got this image of Marty McFly and George McFly, and there it's from the scene uh, in Back to the Future where they first show up and they first collide back in the 1950s. And they're, they're doing the same motion, the same kind of mannerism, right? And it's just funny how we can kind of understand the habits that we have. Oftentimes, we can look back to our own family lineage, our parents specifically, and we get that. I got an image of the of the Bible here, certainly some context there. Uh, I've, I love origin stories in movies, and one of my favorite origin stories is, is Batman Begins. And so I've got that that video here that shows the rise, like where Batman came from, the backstory that was there, that was really well done. Uh, it's a lot of the X-Men movies have done that. There's X-Men Origins, Wolverine, things like that. I, I, I love those movies. I, I've got the, uh, the movie, The Monuments Men. What was that movie about? It was about these uh, soldiers that were going and they were uh, finding all of this history that the Nazis were destroying all of this art uh, trying to erase the past of the of the Jews and other uh, others they deemed undesirable. And so they were going to retrieve this history, and it was worthwhile because of the context that they provided. We needed to preserve that for some reason, so it was worth risking their lives for it. And finally here, I've got two images of some memorials with... Um, uh, from from Washington D.C. and if you go to Washington D.C., you can see the the Vietnam Memorial Wall. Got a little weepy as I was adding these images here. This one always moves me. Um, and then also Arlington Cemetery, so we can look and it's something very moving. If you go to either of these monuments, 
uh, you can see, um, you can just you can just feel the the history that's there. And for somehow, I know this is my experience, but somehow it just grounds me. I remember when I was, uh, I had uh, the privilege of being able to go to Iwo Jima, actually going to the island of Iwo Jima as a Marine and taking a tour of that island. And I remember as we were leaving that island, the plane was taking off. I felt this new identity of what it meant to be a Marine, having walked in the footsteps, walked in that black volcanic sand where so many Marines had, had given their lives to take that to take that island uh, and have that strategic flag raising on the top of Mount Suribachi. Okay. Uh, Jane, I told you I had, a, I had a surprise for you. Well, here it is. You can guess what the next image of Cotex is going to be. Dun, 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 Jack Ryan. I, if I didn't put it, Jane, you were going to put it here. Okay. So I got Jack Ryan from Hunt for Red October. And he's, he's just very high contacts and certainly here knows the history of of the uh, of the enemy and is able to make good sound decisions based on that history. Okay, I threw a lot up here. I want to open the floor up to people. What might might what might we add to this to this uh, word picture to better understand context? What else could we add? Or what is landing well? Or what's not landing well? Like what's landing well? What's not landing well? And I'd love to get some of our number ones. I know Marianne. You're a number one context. Marty, you're number one. Marianne, you can pop on here. What do you got, Marianne? There we go. Uh, what really resonated with me was the genealogy there, the family tree. I was actually thinking about that because before I got on the call, and I was specifically thinking about, and this ties in with your little Bible there, um, the genealogy of Jesus because a lot of people think it's really boring when it comes up in the liturgy and we have to read it and go through all of the generations. And I think boring, it's fascinating. It's the whole story of salvation history, you know, shortened. Um, and it's people with people. I, you have a lot of military um, things up here. I agree their context, but, when it comes to, I, and I was reading in the, um, the report I got for my strengths about liking military conflicts or the history of military conflicts or something, that does not resonate with me. I get, if someone describes a battle right away, I'm confused and I don't get it. It's the people and I have a history, a bachelor's degree in history. And what really has always fascinated me is people like the British, like the Tudors and Mary Queen of Scots and all of that, the people there. And that was how I basically learned history by having charts of these different um, lineages. And Mary Ann, I'm, I'm, I'm curious. I'm curious. So your number one context, what are some of your adjacent themes in your top five? Can you recall? Yes. Connectedness is two learner input and intellection okay all right so we've got a lot of green but that connectedness and and i'm wondering even if we want up if there's more relationship themes that are that are there yeah in um the next five it's uh harmony developer responsibility harmony developer restorative and empathy beautiful yeah, there's something about that. And I, I remember I'm not high context. It's 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 29 for me, but that was always the piece that fascinated me. I got my master's in history and I don't even really enjoy history that much. My got my master's in it, but I loved the military history. So I got a lot of it at the Naval Academy and then the Marine Corps was uh, the things that always intrigued me were the way that uh, the military leaders and their their lack of virtue often indicated where the battle was going to go. Right. Especially you have those the, the stories of the Civil War. So so the based on the virtue or the vice of the leader, that was also often the greatest lever point in terms of where the battle went. Uh, mm -hmm. Awesome. So, Marianne, awesome. Having some more connection with with uh, perhaps the context of the of, of the personal of the, of the people that are in this. And I remember Christopher West 
uh, sharing at Theology of the Body Institute about that lineage. And this is kind of a, a high context, uh, but high connectedness statement. So it goes, you remove one of those sexual unions from that lineage and think about the catastrophic, tr- catastrophic impact on all of history. Right. And the way that he says, like, literally, what is going on in the bedroom is it involves all of history and all of the future. Literally what, what people are doing in the bedroom. I mean, that is like hyper connectedness, but also a great understanding of context too. Okay. What else here, folks? What else can we add to this? Um, Marty, anything that you want to throw on here? I'm putting you on the spot, but you're number one. Yeah. Um, I also have a bachelor's in history. Um, and that's, honestly probably one of my favorite genres to read um and honestly I was thinking of maybe adding the mummies and let me explain (laughs) so uh one time my brother and I we went to the museum uh with an exhibit of the mummies and here we are we're looking at these mummies and understanding of course there's this sense of reverence of these people that lived, you know, well before the time of Christ for some, in some cases, right? Um, And one of the things that caught my attention there was these people were preserving the body for burial for the possibility of a bodily resurrection. And I'm sitting there like, wait a second, that was coming up before Jesus showed up and actually made this whole bodily resurrection thing possible. And then extending that promise to us that at some point we too will get to experience that. And for me, just seeing that value of seeing that the history of the human person um, and also the value of that body I have to ask God sometimes, like, what were you thinking? But, but somehow that's shown up for me as a personal trainer and reminding myself there's something to be said about respecting the body, preserving the body, um, because at some point in time, that bodily resurrection is going to happen and we're going to see the perfected version of our bodies. So that's how that's shown up for me. And Marty, it's it's fascinating to hear you say that, knowing that you're in the context of knowing that you are a coach, right? You have you bring the mindset coach, but also you bring the physical element as a as a personal trainer here as well. And even knowing your story of your of your stroke and the recovery of that, and just the redemption in the small way, a foretaste of the redemption of your body through your own healing, being a foretaste of the redemption of your body at the second coming. And just what, what beautiful reverence even in, that you have for the body and just considering that and looking at the history. I love, I could hear your awe in that and, and, and I felt filled by that. So thank you very much, Marty, for sharing that. Mm-hmm. Anybody else want to add to this word picture before we move on and we start diving into, you know, some thoughts on this? Justin, Justin, what do you got, man? Yeah, I mean, I think one obvious thing would be something like a museum or something like that, where, you know, their whole goal is to make the past come alive so that it helps inform what you do. And first of all, I want to take a moment to say, Marty, I love the theme appropriate shirt you got on for today's call. God history. (laughs) Yeah. Um, (laughs) But the other one I was thinking of was an iceberg in that I think context wants to know what's beneath that surface. Um. They're not interested as much as what's visible, except for the fact of how did it become visible and what's supporting it along the way. I mean, history is the the easiest thing that we can tend to point to for context, but it's also, um, I guess another image would be, you know, you're seeing a map, but in a way, I think context wants to be able to zoom out to that next level and see, well, what's informing this map? And then what's informing that map? and so forth and so on. And the more you can situate something within where it's come from, I I think, and again, it's not high for me, but I think it allows someone with context to to viscerally know, like you described going to Iwo Jima, feeling the sand, walking there, and it's very different than looking at pictures of Iwo Jima on a slideshow or something like that. And 
I, I think context really like really gets that in a way that those without that theme is high. Um, appreciate it when it happens, but context knows that it's going to happen every single time. Mm. Um, and then, um, yeah, finally, I think your Bible one's interesting because we always talk about, you know, the the Old Testament is the New Testament concealed. And so why do we study the Old Testament so that we can understand the New Testament? Um, that's why it's so critical that it's in there. It's like, well, just read about Jesus. Like, well, you're not going to understand Jesus because the church understands that you need to understand the thousands of years that came before to make mm-hmm. Jesus even make sense to us beyond the just simple teachings that he provides to us. Yes. Yes. No, I, I'm glad you brought that up, Justin. It's even a little bit of a foreshadowing, a teaser into the scripture that we're going to be diving into during our Lexio portion of the call here. Uh, I think of even you could add the mass to something. There's something about context that pre- preserves ritual that says, okay, that ritual is a way of preserving some sort of history. And so people that are quick to discard ritual, that can often be tri- triggering to context is, say, oh, w- before we throw this out, before we throw this out, let's understand why we're doing this in the first place and and why we even got around to this. Everybody's heard the the story about the uh the 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 woman roast doing the roast in the oven right and cutting the piece off and putting it off to the side and then she said well I, I just my mom did it that way and then she asked her mom and she's like oh my mom just did it that way and then grandma shows up and she says oh the reason i cut that piece off and put it in the other part of the pan is because like, my pan wasn't big enough i just i needed to put it in a different part of the pan right and so uh sometimes context right needs to be explored again so we're preserving something and the meaning of something rather than just the ritual of something. We'll talk more about that when we get into the the virtuous and vicious expressions of this theme. Corey, you've got it at 22. What do you got? I think of a family treasure chest, especially ones that uh, shows uh, thoughts like greeting cards between, especially like you said about um, family history and genealogy. Mm -hmm. I think that um, my parents love story and my grandparents love story. And, you know, when I, you're not thinking of the, well, so much as when you're a small kid, but then as we grow older and we go through our lives, it's like, oh, they were young too. And they had, you know, they were in this place. And so I think about, um, I think about family treasure chests and how that really, um, I mean, genealogy is one thing and, um, as far as finding out who's who and where they lived and what they did. But another mm-hmm. thing, those, those stories and those exchanges, um, as well as, photographs and and other um things that that you'd find in a family treasure box beautiful family treasure box like even a time capsule could be something that we could add in here awesome thanks Corey. uh jane at 14 jane the one that you ask about the watch and she says are you gonna say it jane did i steal your thing no 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 I, no 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 i wasn't what is the expression that. that they say about you ask jane about the watch she's gonna uh, so, tell you what so So my husband always says, you know, there's a saying, like, if you ask someone what time it is, they're going to tell you how to build the watch. But then he always asks, adds, and Jane will tell you the history of the watch as well. (laughs) So, but, um, and I'm like, okay, whatever. And then, and then when I took my, my strengths, I was like, well, no wonder context is high for me and it's right after communication. So I have to explain things. I have to communicate the contents. But one of the things I was going to add is um, uh, either like the Grand Canyon or like here in El Paso, we have this mountain called Mount Crystal Ray. And my, my friend and I went on it with a, a geology professor from our, our local university here. And he, it was really awesome because when we got up to the top, then he was showing us all the different mountains and all of the different soil. And I remember mm. when I was in high school, we I took a geography class, but the teacher was a geologist more than a geography. So we did a lot of the geology aspects of, you know, understanding the different types of rivers and how rivers are created and different things like that. And it just reminded me when Justin talked about the iceberg of of the creation, there's a story in creation and, and, you know, the, or maybe even a tree, you know, how you have the rings around a tree, like there's Mm. content and context about life, not just, 
and and of course because you're military and because context is low for you <laughs> no, i'm just kidding yeah. it's you got <laughs> you've got a lot of military ones you know but actually that's where my husband and i really connect because he is so grounded in the military history and and i'm with um with marty and and marianne it's like i'm i discovered history my love for history in historical fictions and um, just another funny little story. Last year, when we were go- doing our pilgrimage, my priest and I were talking about how this El Paso used to be part of the Santa Fe uh, diocese. That's like b- the first bishop in this area was in Santa Fe, and and he was like, "Oh yeah, well, he was also the bishop of Denver." I'm like, "No, that was his assistant." And he's like, "No, no, no," and I go, "No." I know the story and because I had read Death Comes to the Archbishop by Willa Cather. And so I got home and I I like text it and then I looked it up and I text him. I was like, no, that was Father Joe. And, you know, and he went to Denver, but um, Father Jean-Baptiste, because I couldn't remember the bishop's name. And I was like, it was Bishop Jean-Baptiste. He was a, a Canadian. And I knew the whole story of like the whole context of why he became the Bishop of Santa Fe. And, and I was like going into it and he was like, how do you know all this stuff? Well, I read and anyway, so it just just makes it, you know, the history of, of a place anyway, sorry. Yes. No, Jane, I heard you say the context of why the context of why, right. And I think that's what context can do is it can help us to answer the why question, the meaning question, the purpose question. And that's as we jump to the next slide here, that's that's my biggest, my 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 best stab at what's motivating context. I have understanding the original design. Understanding the original design. You could maybe put in here understanding the intents of the designer. Again, this is all flowing through my own particular lens, right? The Metanoia Catholic, we explore unique design. It's a huge thing. Absolutely fascinates me. Uh, And a lot of what we do to explore unique design is we look at our story and the habitual ways that we've shown up. We, We look at our fulfillment stories, drawing on that work and story from Josh Miller, um, that book, Unrepeatable, and anybody that's taken the M-Code assessment, it's exactly what it does. It looks at fulfillment stories and dives into and does some analysis of what, what was driving you in those fulfillment stories. But here I have for context, I wonder if context is driven by understanding the original design. How does this land? How does this land? Originally, Justin, when I threw it out on our strengths nerd chat channel that that we've got, you said it was it was pithy. Uh, so maybe you can pop on here. But Catherine, what do you got? How does this land? Hi, I don't know if you can. Can you hear me? I can. It's a little, okay. Yeah, I didn't take the test yet, but as I'm listening, I'm I'm thinking that. Yeah, I always want to understand the why of why people do things. And I think once I understand the why, then I can say, okay, yeah, that makes sense. And, you know, so even things like, you know, abortion and all these things, I can understand why people do things, even if I don't agree and i'm like well that's not in the the unique design like i feel like i've always kind of had that that wanting to know like some people can say oh that person made the decision and then then just just drop it but for me i almost i need to know why they did it and then once i find out why they did it then i can kind of let it go okay so Um, it's it's important you need to know the why and then you can let it know let it go why tell me why is the why important I guess once I know the why, everything makes sense to me. Okay. Um, and I don't know if that's because I have a high empathy as well and sort of a curiosity as well. But um, 
like for me, it's sort of like once I know the why, you can let go of the, or you could kind of like let the person have their own journey or something like this. Okay. Um, okay. And no, so allow, I hear freedom showing up in there. Just understanding the why is this kind of there's 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 just a, a, a bit of holding the space. It makes it a little bit easier to hold the space for the other person. Yeah, but at the same time, it can show up as well. I know why they did it once I hear the story, and so you want them to change quickly. So it can also show up viciously in that way, where you're like, "Well, this okay. is why it makes so much sense in terms of like a thought." reasoning and like all their life um or like our own life choices or what happened and trauma and all you can kind of piece it all together as to why sure. so yep. in some regards they could show up viciously as like also not being patient so it can go both ways right right no i got it. Catherine. thank you for that and one of the things that michelle dunn shared uh that that i wanted to share here today she says context for me has to do with big picture orientation by information and having an idea of all the pieces involved in order to begin. And she admits my arranger has something to do with that for sure. So that context arrangement has to do with figuring out, getting a big picture orientation to things and understanding. She says, context frees me from using pr uh, predictive text. In other words, I prefer to start from current data versus making assumptions. So I like that. I prefer to start with current data rather than operating from assumptions. This is why futuristic and context, you can see are an unlikely pair in Gallup, right? Um, where I know I'm low context, but I'm high futuristic, and I, I am happy to operate from assumptions, which is why I tend to be very pioneering in the type of work that we do. Uh, Marianne, what do you got? Okay. Yeah, at first when I saw that original design, I thought, oh, I don't know, um, because with context, I don't have to go all the way back in a lot of cases. But then I suddenly, I think while Catherine was talking, something hit me. Um, the job I had before I retired the first time, <laughs> um, I had it for 22 years. And I reached retirement age, we had new leadership. I reached retirement age, my friend reached retirement age and he was the quality assurance, at that point, quality assurance, but he'd done a lot of things in, um, in the mental health system. And there were a couple of other people and the ones who were staying were saying, all that institutional knowledge is walking out the door. And that's mm. what we have. And he had, and a lot of times newer people would come in and case managers and they'd say, well, I don't know why we have to do it this way. And then we'd say, well, this is why, this is why it was set up this way. This is the original design. And um, in particular, my friend had sat on the state committee when they set, made up the standard for the whole state. And every time there'd be a question and somebody Oh, I think we lost you, Marianne. Kind of coming in and out right now. Oh, Marianne, it looks like you're muted. I didn't even but, know about context. <laughs> but um, yeah, so in cases like that, especially with that job, um, when so many new people had come in over the years and questioned it, um, it, it was the people with context that would say, uh, this is why it's this way. And why it's best that we do it this way. Right, right. Okay, so there's there's a, there's a conservative bend that, that you can see, and, and I'm not saying that in a political sense, but literally conserving the way things are. I see context being a very stabilizing strength here as well. So where ideation can bend more innovative context and futuristic can bend more innovative context can kind of uh, ground us in some consistency. Uh, Jane and then Justin. Yeah, you took the word right out of my mouth. Actually, I was just thinking of of, of grounding, and I um I I thought of this weekend when we were on our pilgrimage. One of the parishioners I I 
I know, you know, I know where they sit and we never really talked. And so we were sharing and I was asking where they came from and everything. And then he asked me and literally my answer was, I don't know, because as a military brat, I literally have no contents except context, except for in the military. Like I, you know, I always tease people say I have green blood because I'm not from, I'm not from anywhere. Whereas here in where I live, there's so much history and they can go back generation to generation, to generation, to generation. And so I think that's the other thing. The other aspect of it is, is that context wants to be grounded because they want like Justin, that such a beautiful word picture for me is that iceberg is that it's not just the 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 ice that you see above the sea, but it's that deepness. It's that yearning to go. And maybe, maybe that's my intellection going as well. Intellection is high for me and I want to go deep, but I want to understand the, like maybe not original design, but the design, it, like Marianne said, you don't have to go back to the, all the way to the beginning, but go far enough that you're, you're fed. Like Catherine was saying is I want to know the story and then I can let it go. Like I need the grounding. It's got to go deep enough. Yeah. I'm wondering if, if maybe original intent might ring a little bit better rather than original design, because, you know, we say design is one of the just is, is when you take an abstract intent and you architect something, you design something to kind of preserve it. And so uh, the design is often the intent made incarnate. Uh, but really, it's the intention that you're seeking to preserve here. Uh, Justin, I'm going to hold off on you. You'll have the last word, and then I'm going to. But I'm going to go to Kevin because we haven't heard from Kevin yet, and he's at number four contact. So, Kevin, you hop on. Yeah, sorry. I don't want you guys to see my bloated nose, but hold on. Kevin's homesick today to give everybody <laughs> some context, <laughs> which is good. Ah, darkness. Um, I guess one thing that strikes me as much as anything, um, you know, when you're talking about, um, you know, the original design and reference references goes back to, you know, the catechism, which isn't, isn't that old, you know, but the, the knowledge and the wisdom that come with it is ancient. And, you know, I think during our call yesterday, um, Oh, who was it? I think Janae had brought it up, um, or actually Aaron did. Um, when you bring up the catechism, it really puts things in place. And let's be honest, frankly, most people haven't read the catechism. And mm -hmm. it's, it's such a beautiful history, uh, historical book to some degree, but current book. It is very powerful. So, you know, when we talk about context and history, you know, I, I look at that original design and, and part of it is I'm, you know, in the uh, diaconate program here in Montana. So um, we're taking a deep dive into, you know, the catechism. And I've been a Catholic all my life, 12 years of Catholic school, and I have never dealt this deep into the catechism before. So, you know, references to that, uh, make application. It, it, I think it's eye opening for me anyway. Eye opening for you to, to just have that depth of knowledge that goes into the catechism. Yeah. I mean, you, and you start to see even the ethic that is proposed the, the rule, so to speak. And when you understand the, the why behind the rules, the rules are things where it's like, okay, I can, Oh yeah, I can see what the rules are preserving the good that it's preserving. It's not something that's arbitrary. Rather, it's something that has, there's intention behind it. Nothing is arbitrary that the church proposes. And I know that's, that's certainly my experience getting to read into the catechism and dig into the histories. Anything else, Kevin? Yeah, yeah I would say order um, on that as well. You know, the order and structure is beautiful. The other thing I think I mentioned real quick was uh, the movie Hacksaw Ridge. I've seen it a few times and I watched it last night, but what an amazing movie. And I think, you know, looking at the hero in that movie and the virtue and the struggles that he, you know, implored in there draws me. And I think it draws anybody to that movie, but draws me to, to live that virtue and, and stick to your guns, no matter what, what the cost may be personally. 
So it's a very beautiful movie. Yes. So that conviction that the uh, protagonist in that movie, I can't recall his name, but I, James Garfield plays him. That's about yeah. it. Uh, yeah. But the con the conviction that he had perhaps born from that deep appreciation, certainly born from a deep faith that he had in an understanding of, of, of uh, the extreme witness, the radical witness uh, of his Christian faith to which he was called uh, in the context of, uh, of, of where he was goodness gracious, the worst of all battlefields, Justin, and then we'll hop over to, uh, our, our Lexio. Yeah. I, I think the only thing maybe to riff on this a little is really just, I think the motivation in a way is just understanding our origins, you know, knowing our design, knowing our intent, knowing where we came from, knowing what informed everything that led up to today. Um, I think for someone like me, where history tends to be facts and figures and trivia in a lot of ways, and I I don't viscerally appreciate it. And I, I think for folks with context, history is not dead. History is now. I mean, we are here because of the every moment that led up to this point. And I think that's the appreciation that people with context really understand that history is alive. And it makes no more sense to ignore the person standing in the room yesterday than to ignore the people who were standing here a hundred years prior. Um, and I think that, and so I think there's that element like you tie, you know, I think someone with context appreciates what the blueprint is um, mm. or what the blueprint was because that blueprint didn't come together randomly. Um, it was put there by a reason. Now, maybe it needed to change. Maybe there's adjustments, but, you know, every addition to a house points back to the original house that was built. Um, and I think that's something that context in a lot of ways gets and appreciates the way other strengths don't necessarily. Beautiful. Okay. So we see some of the, uh, the, getting the intention of the original design, the, the, uh, understanding what that is. Uh, let's jump here now. Thanks, everybody, for sharing. Let's jump here now to the Lexio. So this one, surprise, surprise, Matthew 5, 17, pulled this right out of the Living in Your Strengths Catholic Edition. Uh, and so Matthew 5, 17, we look to Scripture here as we pivot to our virtuous and vicious conversation because there's no greater reference point to inform how context ought to show up in order to understand how to express it virtuously. So what does the Scripture say? It says, this is Christ saying, do not think that I've come to abolish the law or the prophets. I have come not to abolish, but to fulfill. Matthew 5, 17, do not think that I have come to abolish the law or the prophets. I have come not to abolish, but to fulfill. I think of another Another scripture where he says, there's not one dot, not one dash of the law that's going to be lost. You know, that's all still, all still applies here, but there's a fulfillment that's also happened here as well. So what does this mean about how context can show up virtuously? Okay. I think of the ways that people will, will often weaponize scripture often the new atheism will rep weaponize the old testament and say ah well they're justifying slavery or they're justifying justifying you know putting the ban on people or, or or violence or or unjust war or human sacrifice like and and even but that and i remember scott hahn sharing if you take the text out of context, you will make a pretext. Okay. And so I hear that in Christ's words here that we need to look to the past in all order to understand the work that I that I'm doing right now. So don't think that just ignore this. That's kind of the lazy person's approach to this, but rather it's the other scripture that comes to mind, it's it's like the steward that goes to the wine cellar and brings forth the old, both the old and the new together. It needs to be presented together here. Do not think that I've come to abolish the law or the prophets. What are we getting from this, folks? How might this inform a virtuous expression of context? Jane. 
Well, it also just reminds me of this past weekend, the Feast of the Transfiguration, where our Lord, you know, up on the Mount, who did he, who did he, dis, who was he having a conversation with, but Moses and Elijah, the prophet and the law, mm -hmm. right? Um, and preparing his disciples with the glimpse of his glory, and yet telling them not to share this experience until after he was raised from the dead, but giving them a little bit of hope. And I think that's what this, this brings is, um, is the hope that, you know, not as all lost. And I think that's one of the things that came up for me when you were talking about the motivation was, I think that's one of the reasons why there's so much turmoil in the world at this moment because many of us who do have high context understand the value of things that are being abolished at the moment, mm -hmm. you know, like, I don't know about the Marines, but you know, the army is like changing every single military installation that had a civil war general. And it's like, you don't understand why that army installation was named after for you know fort hood you don't even know who general hood is you know and so that's just kind of the like no the lord gives us hope in that because he's not abolishing there was a purpose for the law there's a purpose for the prophets and he's fulfilling those that purpose that original design it's like it's not um an extra and it wasn't what's the word Sup super superfluous Mm -hmm. Does that make sense? Yeah, yeah. But there was, there was a, like you said, it's an original design. Like, no, there was a reason. Trust me. I have the method to the madness is what I always say. There's a method to this madness. You might not understand it, but I'm fulfilling it. So. Yeah. I, I, what, what I hear in this also in this passage is, is, and thank you for that, Jane. Uh, what I hear of this is like, don't cling to the past. There's a fulfillment that's coming. Like, look, look for the fulfillment in the context of what was happening in the past. And uh, yeah, that's, so just don't get stuck in the past. Marty, what do you have? Um, well, one of the things that caught, I guess came to mind for me was, you know, we look at, you know, one of the current trends of the church, you know, people leave in the church, right? Mm -hmm. um, and some of that I think might have to do, and this is my opinion, might have to do with the fact that we've forgotten our story. Um, and even the story behind the Eucharist, which goes, I mean, we go back to the Last Supper, but that goes all the way back to Passover. So if we understand the history there, we understand, you know, Jesus at the Last Supper, and then it can bring us to a better understanding of what's going on in our Mass, what's going on in the Eucharist, and where is that pointing to for us? And how do we come back together as a community and as a communion? in light of the fulfillment of the Passover meal. Love it. Love it. And, and I know you're a big TOB fan as well, Marty. And, and I think of John Paul II. And uh, one of the reasons why he wrote the theology of the body is because, and, and even love and responsibility is because we have forgotten who we are, right? We've mm -hmm. forgotten what it means to be human. And so those are the two questions he asked with this TOB is, what does it mean to be human? And then based on that, how do we live our lives? What's the ethic that we live by so that we can live a life that really brings us to true happiness and beatitude? Awesome. Awesome. So we have to, we have to go back to the origin. That's exactly what he did. What he did. What does he do? He goes back to original man, right? He goes back to the man in the garden before sin. Then he looks at historical man, man fallen, but also redeemed. And then he goes into the eschatological man, that man in the future, man of heaven. Where are we going? Uh, and understanding everything in the context of story, like you said there, Marty. Great. Excellent here, folks. Let's jump forward into our, our understanding. Uh, what are some of the virtuous and vicious expressions of this? So again, to give some context, uh, we look at how uh, these talents will show up in the context of a relationship to make a judgment on whether it's a virtuous or a vicious expression. So a virtuous expression is going to show up interdependent, which means there's this balance leaning on one another. You're showing up as body of Christ, right? 
not independent, right? That's one of the vicious signs uh, where you're just kind of on your own. Uh, not dependent, dependent relationships are where you need somebody to show up or act a certain way in order for you to feel or show up a certain way. Uh, nor codependent, right? Codependent relationships are where they're shallow. Nobody's really seen and nobody is really invited to grow from where they're at. They're just accommodated to stay where they're at. All right. Very kind of vicious mindset there. So what's a virtuous interdependent uh, uh, expression of context? Well, here's what I got. Pre the person that's pr high context, when they present and preserve the value of the intention of the original design in the past to preserve what is valuable in the present and the future. Okay. So they present and preserve the value of the original design, the intention of the original design from the past in order to preserve what is valuable in the present and the future. A little wordy, but I think I'm getting it, getting the gist across there. All right. Marty, I see kind of going like, a, eh, okay, maybe, you know, but like thinking this, how, how does this draw us to be interdependent? Well, the person that's high in context, they're the ones that are going to bring to the, to the, to the table. I, I like picture of a board table that's getting, that's trying to make a decision on how to move forward with an organization. And they may be quick to abolish those innovative futuristic types, maybe quick to abolish the past or throw out the past way of doing things to just move with an innovative approach. And then that person that's high context, would be, hey, before we move forward here, let's just, let's just understand, let me give you a little bit of an understanding of what the original intent was behind uh, our, our current design and why we've been operating this way. And then we can make an, a judgment of whether or not that is something we still need to preserve, whether it's still, you know, makes sense to do things that way. Because technology happens, innovation happens, people come and go. And, uh, and so uh, circumstances change and sometimes things can become irrelevant, kind of like the, the slicing, that, slicing the, the roast in the pan example that we showed, uh, kind of irrelevant to continue doing that once you get a bigger pan. Okay, on the vicious side, uh, leading to independence this is where context refuses to see value in innovation. So just clinging to the past and just putting the past on a ped pedestal, pretty much making the past an idol and not having an appreciation for the fulfillment of the law showing up. We can see even the Pharisees kind of having this clinging to the past, right? They knew it very well. And there was certainly some good. There's this desire to conserve, but it was to the point where they couldn't see the fulfillment when he was standing right in front of them. All right, leads to dependence. I could see this where somebody high context is frustrated when others do not value the past. Um, but then also they don't, they don't actually go forth and communicate the value in relative terms. Okay. So they can say that I value this, therefore it's important and I need you to value it, but they don't actually do the hard work of communicating why it's valuable. Okay. They just demand the other person sees the past or whatever it is that you're conserving is valuable. And then finally leads to codependence indulges is when context indulges in the glory days. All right. The sitting around telling the, telling the good old days stories. Okay. How does this land for people that are high context? Where can you see where you may have shown up on the vicious side or the virtuous side of things? Feel free to add to some of these, uh, these expressions here as well. All right, Mariana, how's this landing with you? Uh, yeah, that that does land with me. It can go, it can go awry. <laughs> um, they all I can. Think, I think, yeah, I think it's a true interdependent relationship would be if you remember the past, you know the past, you remember it, you can communicate it. And then you're willing to move forward with the people who want to move forward, but with that solid base of this was our mission, this was our intent when this was done. These are the boundaries that we live within, um, but not be resistant to change. And I think a lot of people do, um, especially you know when you get older, 
and you're close to retirement and, and a job, you'll find a number of people that we've always done it this way. It's the only way we should do it. I'm not changing. And they just like butt heads with uh, the newer people coming in. So the ideal would be to be able to use the path. Yeah, as it's, a good. Solid base. it's a good thing. We don't have anybody like that in the church. <laughs> right. Yeah. We've yeah, always done I, it this way, the, the cave dwellers, right? Yeah. And I, yeah, and I think also they don't go back far enough because if they remembered the whole history, they wouldn't be panicking over every little thing that goes wrong. And it's a lot of people are like, it's the end of the world because something changed or mm -hmm. somebody wants to change something. But we have a very long history and the gates of hell will not prevail against the church. And I think it would help if some people had a little more contact or listen to people that did going further back and going through the history. Yeah. And, and you know, what? perhaps, perhaps the, that's the burden you bear you and Marty with context. Number one <laughs> is, and I mean, this is, this is, it's, there's, there's a cross that's associated with stepping into these and stepping into who we are is like, no, if, if, if the person at number one context, isn't going to speak up and say, Hey, like this is, remember this, remember, right? Remember Simba, remember, right? Like to, to hearken us back to remember those things. If context is not going to do that, I'm telling you what, futuristic is not going to do that. Mm -hmm. All right. Ideation is likely not going to do that, but context has that natural inclination to do that. Uh, Janae, I'm going to put you on the spot here and invite you to come on after Jane, because I know you've got your husband, Chris, who's number two context, and it's your 34 which I think is just interesting. So you'll probably be able to speak to all his vicious sides of showing up. Uh, but anyways, Jane, go ahead. No, I just have a story of, of my daughter who lived very interdependence of this context when she was in high school and it just floored me. She's 35 now. But one of the things she said to me was, um, well, she was probably 20 now when we she shared the story, but it was when she was 16 and 17, starting to drive, starting to go to parties and do things. And what she told me was there was always there was always two thoughts in my mind whenever I went out with friends. The first is I never, how did she say it? I never wanted to dishonor the Snyder name. And then the other, and then the other question she would ask herself was, if my father walked into the room right now, what would his impression be of me? And I'm sitting here like, what? How in the heck did I even raise this girl? Like, Good where did job this? Me. No, <laughs> I, not me at all. But he, <laughs> she has high context, and my husband has. I'm sure of it. He has high context because that's where they. Th I mean, she's an environmental specialist and does a lot of water resource management because conservative. That yes, she wants the. You know, so I can see it. But it was just a beautiful moment for me, of seeing that past understanding who we are you know she's part of the snyder she had this knowingness of being a snyder and yet her future behavior you know it was just a glorious moment and i praise god that she shared it with me because i i was completely humbled because i was like i don't know how that happened <laughs> praise the lord grace 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 but you participated there too jane I'll give you a pat on the shoulder, even though you won't. You're a good mom, Mama Jane. Okay, who else? Who else? Janae, do you got anything for us? Sure. Yeah. So as you said, context is 34 um, for me. It's number two for my husband. I wouldn't say that he's super into history. I think that's probably just some of his other themes coming into play. Uh, but I will say that I have been on the receiving end of, <laughs> I mean, we both can be vicious, right, in our own things. Um, but it's a, it's an interesting place because I'm always very future focused and I can see just from this discussion, how much it would really help me. First of all, when you use the word, our story, instead of history, all of a sudden it went from like something that sounded something I would want, not want to be involved in at all. When you said history to like our story, I'm like, Ooh, I could get behind that. Um, so that's just something interesting 
that I noticed when y'all were talking about all this. I noticed when we go to museums and things, like I am, first of all, a museum is not high on my list to go to ever, like at all. Um, but if I do go, I'm like very quick. <laughs> Let's just look at everything quickly and like, oh, that's really cool. Um, but he'll he'll just read stuff a whole lot more than I will, mm. uh, especially when it has to do with certain topics, I think. Um, he's definitely more interested in people. Um, and he's more interested in like, he likes church history. That's been really big along his just growth in the faith, for sure, is understanding like where we were, uh, where, how we, where we've come from, all of those pieces. Um, but even within our own relationship and our own family, I'm very quick to be like, okay, we have a new direction. Let's go in this direction, like gung ho. And he's like, but you haven't done it as long as I've known you. <laughs> like, can you not remind me of that right now? <laughs> like, and he's not the only one. It's like, well, we have never done this before. I'm like, well, so what? That doesn't matter. We can always figure it out. But I, I can see how a discussion is always helpful. Like when we can he can explain his point of view and I can say, okay, well, I could see how we could come up with a strategy for X, Y, and Z in order to maybe move a little bit to my idealistic future vision or whatnot. Um, so I tend to not get caught up in the past myself, obviously being, being 34, but I see, I love being around all of y'all and those that are high in context because it really teaches me how it can really serve me to be a lot more present. One thing I'll also say, is when I heard Simon Hurry po podcast once on context, he talked about how present people with mm. context are. And I forget his reasoning as to why that was so. Um, maybe it's like that they're always gathering data. They're always like wanting to comprehend. They're always wanting to just take in like the reality of what is, whereas I'm not really great at that. And my husband is really, really good at that. Like he is great at being with our kids. He's great at just being with me and not like worrying about, other things, whereas my mind is constantly elsewhere. And my dad too is really good at this, um, but I won't get into that because he has not taken the strengths finder yet, but I, he's probably pretty high in context as well. <laughs> I, I remember yeah. that. I remember Simon Hurry's podcast and he talks about how present minded people with context are because they're so motivated to be able to have those memories later on. And they want to be able to recall. And one of the reasons why they're so good at recalling the past is because they're so attentive to the details in the present moment. Uh, interesting. Justin, what do you got before we go to the uh, mindsets? Yeah, I just want to say, I think what really separates the virtuous from vicious for these is the the desire to breed success versus find reasons that it won't succeed or, or for failure. So, you know, on the virtuous side, they're going to dig in the past because they don't want to people with context really don't want to make the same mistake twice. Um, but they don't want to make the same mistake twice so that we can be successful in whatever it is we're trying to do today. Where on the vicious side, I think yeah. it's, I want to just avoid the mistake. Um, and it's focusing on the failure that I think really when it is when it goes vicious. So I, I think, you know, so I think way, ways it can manifest from the person who loves to just say, I told you, I, I told you so, I told you this wouldn't work. You know, the ones who love to throw out, you know, the definition of insanity is doing the same thing over and over again and expecting different results. So I'm like, oh, that's great, but you didn't actually give me any input to start with. So thanks. Yes. Um, or, um, or even superstition, I think, is one that people with context, um, if it's a little out of whack, they can say, well, we've always done it this way, but that's they're just focusing on that as the truth itself and not the why. So we're not going to do this because last time we did this, it failed. So that means it's always going to fail if we do it this way, you know, which is sometimes tantamount of saying, I don't have my lucky socks on, therefore this isn't going to work. Um, and so I, I think those are ways to, to kind of see if this is presenting virtuous or vicious is, What's their focus on bringing up the past? It's is it to help or to just shoot down? Right. Is it is it a one sided conversation or are we bringing the past evidence to the to the table, but also a present understanding and uh, of of the circumstances, and and then uh, letting reason apply? Right. So a vicious expression of of context, I think, would be divorcing uh, that that 
joy of bringing or the delight in bringing the past evidence, all that data forward, like Michelle Dunn said, I want to ground uh, my decisions in data versus assumptions and uh, and being dismissive of, of new data, perhaps, or the present circumstances uh, that, that need to be a big factor in the decisions that we make today. Uh, Kevin, if you want to come on here, I see you got a, uh, you put a hand up in the chat if you want to jump on and, uh, and then we'll jump into our, uh, uh, the mindsets, Kevin. We'll just make it quick, but I think the one thing that, you know, that struck me, I guess, with what Janae said, um, talking about our story and, and history, I think the one big thing for me that, that kind of transitioned me into a more of a love for history is to, re to talk about it as his story. Um, and it's, it, that, that change in my mindset alone was, was pretty powerful is that, you know, for me, I can't ignore it, obviously try not to live in it in the past, understand it like Justin was saying as well, and, and try to change the future. Um, anyway, I just, that was something that struck, struck me, um, you know, earlier conversation. No, it, it makes sense, Kevin, in terms of being able to see your own story in light of uh, Christ's story. Certainly. I mean, and that's, that's the Christian life, right? It's, it's the, it's one of the beautiful things that we have in the teachings of our church and being able to see your suffering in terms of redemptive suffering, being able to experience your joy in terms of the, 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 the joy that Christ, the delight that, that Christ experiences, even the delight of the resurrection, and, and Christ enters into all of human experience. In fact, even our very existence is a sharing of God's very existence. And so we're just, we, the creatures are, are merely extensions of him. And uh, when we can understand, put ourselves, put our own lives, put our own stories within that context, it has tremendously more meaning than if we just look at it in isolation. Uh, if we look at it in isolation, we tend to make ourselves our own gods, certainly in that process here too. All right. So what are some of these virtuous mindsets, understanding that the way that we express ourselves uh, is, is an overflow or an outcome of the way that we're thinking and our perceptions. So I like to use questions to jumpstart that virtuous mindset. Uh, here's what we got. So the context, person behind context might ask themselves, what was the intention of the original designer? All right. So they're looking to, maybe they're, they find themselves uh, desiring to preserve something. Maybe it's a ritual or it's a, uh, a, 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 a custom or something that they've done, something in their family, uh, family custom, something in the culture. They're looking to preserve something rather than just saying, let's preserve it for the sake of preserving it. What's the it's that what's, what is the intention behind the design? Remember, design is just an incarnational experience or incarnational expression of something that is abstract, an intention that is abstract. So when we can get into the intention of the designer, it's like, okay, well, can this original intention be carried forward in a new design? Is that possible? Maybe there's been innovation or maybe there's been new people that have come to the team that bring new capabilities and therefore a new design is now capable that wasn't capable in the past. And so therefore we can change without the fear of losing the intention. All right. So what was the intention of the original designer? And then the second question is what of the original design is still relevant and one and what can be modified? Okay. So it's again, Understanding that relevance, and that doesn't mean that it has to be relative. We need to be submit, like we need to just go, but rather, what is what is relevance to the uh, with with the uh, with the original design, and and what can be modified? Okay. Uh, the vicious mindsets behind this, okay? So I'm not changing. That has a way of sending somebody down an independent timeline. Remember, independence, you see the value that you bring, but not necessarily the value somebody else is, somebody else is, bring, else is bringing. So you, you're closed off and you're just digging your heels in. Ah, I'm not changing. This is how it is. Those cave dwellers that we talked about constantly against veritably everything, right? Cave dwellers, right? Um, and then what could lead to that dependence? Hey, I value this history and you should too, right? 
that should the shooting on people is often an, a, a way of, of not really honoring their freedom. And it's also abdicating our responsibility as people with high context to communicate what's worth preserving and actually to name it. When you can communicate it, that means you have a level of understanding. And so not just clinging to something because, hey, this is the way it's always been done. Like that's that lasts for one generation. And if we look at our church and we have a generation of people leaving the church because the generation prior to that were parents that just said, well, this is the way it's always been done. And so therefore, but didn't give the actual intent, didn't really understand enough to be able to communicate and pass on the value to their kids, right? That is that is an abuse of context, right? It's a lazy expression of context. It doesn't really it doesn't really meet the other person where they're at. Rather, it demands that they just come to you um, without you having to change or or meet, be uh, uh, considerate of where they're at. And then finally, you know, how can this go codependent? Hey, remember the good old days, man? The world has really gone to crap, right? And I think of the some of the even the different the different shows that are on right now and that 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 even talk about our church. And now everything's going to hell in the handbasket. It's like, okay, well, can we can we put this in the context of of like there being a time where like popes were literally murdering people? Okay, I, I, to my knowledge, it's not happening today, right? But just like putting things into context, right, and and not letting it go down this path where it's it's just like we we start to. We start to focus on everything that's outside of us, but we don't consider what's going on inside us. Or you can see how like this this can be this can be codependent in the sense that there's no demand on you to grow, right? Because everything else is outside. The problem's all outside of you, right? We sit back in those glory days, and we don't really consider, you know, this 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 invitation of the new evangelization that John Paul II has been been sharing, which is which is really a, a, a way of, of bringing or understanding the context of the world that we're in, where we're not in Christendom anymore. There's a great book. I love it. I love it. I love it. I love it. Get it. Monsignor Shea's book, uh, From Christendom to Apostolic Mission. Incredible book. And what he's doing is he's laying, Father Shea is laying the, the, uh, the backdrop of any ministry work that we do today in the context of we're not in Christendom anymore. The mindset is not dominant for Christ or understanding who Christ is or this Christian worldview. That's that's Christendom. That's not today. And so we need to be more apostolic, right? And so there's a lot of looking back to Acts of the Apostles. What were they doing there? Um, and perhaps that should inform the way that we operate in our uh, evangelistic efforts today. And I think John Paul II is leading that charge as well, where he coins this new evangelization term. Okay. All right. And I don't know if he's actually the first one to say it, but I know he's the one that really carried that flag. All right, team. Any other any other thoughts on this? Any other thoughts as we close up? We're 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 kind of long today. So could just go ahead and wrap it up. Anybody got anything burning to share? All right, Corey, what do you got? I do. Um, <clears throat> I wrote it in the chat about this whole talk reminds me of logotherapy, mm -hmm. Peter Frankel, Man's Search for Meaning, and how this is such a useful tool in the therapeutic world, but also just fun to explore um, the his his book and and what that does is helping a person to put their whole life story into context to help them be present and to move forward. Mm -hmm. So anyway, I just I just thought I'd add that. Thanks. Beautiful, beautiful, and, and and even even bring it put it in context, but even even bringing those traumatic memories to completion through the lens of the cross, the resurrection. You know what Christ has done. Behold, I make all things new. Beautiful, Corey. Thank you so much, everybody else. Thank you so much for sharing and and contributing to our context podcast. Here we are, members of the Metanoia Catholic Academy. You can join us at catholiccoaching.com and uh, catholiccoaching.com. Metanoia Catholic is all about helping people to understand the unique plan that God has designed for their life so that they might choose it and live it 
and become saints in the process and transform the church in the process. So we need people becoming who they are. Unique design here, an expression of unique design is your Clifton Strengths Finder assessment, also our temperaments, even M code, and there's some other assessments that we explore in the academy. Uh, but check those things out and join us. All right. This is a great group of people to be journeying with because uh, we are becoming more and more who we are every single day through this reflection on unique design, but also considering the mindsets that are behind it. So learning how to be better stewards of our interior life. All right, folks, thank you so much. Like and subscribe. And uh, we'll see you next week on our, for our next uh, talent theme in the Living in the Virtue of Your Strengths podcast. Blessings.